Okay. This is the call, and I got to go. So you guys have some fun. See you later. I, I'm going to make you the hey. host, Joe. Okay, cool. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the Bucky call. It is Saturday, June 3rd. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here with you guys. Uh, and it's really good to see you, John. Um, it's been a couple of weeks, so yes. I hope all yeah. has been well. Uh, so uh, I'll get started. John, how do you feel? And what would you like to take away from today? I'm feeling good. I've been for a walk down by the river, and uh, it's always nice to connect with nature. And it's nice and cool, but sunny. We've got a lot of rain due this week. So I'm still feeling incredibly fortunate to be in probably the best place in the world. And I think of what's happening everywhere else around the world. So very, very grateful and glad to be back and always keen to learn a little bit more about Bucky. I've been thinking a lot about the grunge of giants, actually. I've had a number of conversations with people where the grunge of giants became relevant. So anyway, I look forward to a bit of critical path today. So that's what I feel like saying. Manu, what do you feel like saying? What do you uh, hope to take out of today? I feel good. Uh, welcome back, John. You know, you look slim and really, you know, kind of uh, brighten up. Anyway, uh, I'm grateful that I'm here again. I'm grateful that we are here and then we're carrying uh, uh, what we have to do. Um, critical path is actually critical at this moment mm. in helping us to understand what is going on and position ourselves in a way that is the least ambiguous and the least, uh, uh, um, how would I say, ideological and try to contribute towards solving problems in the most effective and equitable way that can be. And I'm really glad that, you know, and expecting that we are going to continue on that path reading here and then enriching our study with all our experiences and our questions and everything that we can have that we can share here in order to help us progress. That's what I expected. Joe, how do you feel? What do you expect? with my earbuds there for a minute. Um, uh, I appreciate everybody being here. Um, I feel pretty good. Uh, had a very interesting day. I said goodbye to a friend um, and um, and I was just contemplating how special she was. And uh, uh, so um, it's been a it's been a it's been a good day because I, I realized uh, yeah, just how uh, wonderful people can be. So, uh, so that for that for that you know reason, it's really been it's been a very good day for me. Um, as far as getting, I just look to build off of uh, uh, what we've been. We started part one, uh, and I agree with you. I know mean, critical path is this is um, we're at a point in time uh, where. You know, we we uh, really need to think about um, the whole planet um, and everybody that is on it uh, and every sentient being on it. And so uh, I think that this is, uh, you know, going through this book is providing us with context um, as to uh, what needs to be thought about. Uh, when we're actually going to take action in the world. Uh, you know, I was actually just talking to somebody else about a critical path, not necessarily related to the book, um, but initially I thought about it, okay, this is in terms of a project, but uh, now we're talking about it in terms of humanity. Uh, so I think that this is a, I'm really excited to continue on our journey and reading this book. And I very much appreciate both being here today it's it's a uh, it's really a privilege to be here with both of you um so with that i'm going to share my screen and we can get started okay do you mind reading john happy to you do it so well 
Hang on, let me just uh, scroll down a little for you. Ready? Is yep, the size that, okay? Yep, yep, that's okay. We see it as hardly feasible to have telescan from elsewhere in universe, the DNA, RNA like coding of a complex angle and frequency programming together of terrestrially occurring chemical elements into their molecule, molecule combining chemistries to successively produce a variety of species such as trilobites, dinosaurs, etc., as a progression of elsewhere controlled earth landing tests. We see it also as highly feasible that these landings were used to discover the most suitable types of local in-universe information harvesters and problem solvers. The critical limit experiences of the successive creature landings we see thereafter being sent back to some cosmic headquarters, thereby to guide the improvement of the design of the landings of thick skinned creatures, able to cope with greater annual temperatures range, greater annual temperature ranges than are humanly tolerable. And after further millions of years have passed and the environmental conditions have become auspicious, we see it becoming feasible to telescan the assembling of humans on earth thereafter inbreeding some of them into the ape stages. We can comprehend how South Sea Atoll, lagoon frolicking male and female human swimmers, gradually inbred pairs of underwater swimmers who held their breath in their lungs for ever longer periods. And after many inbreedings of largest lungers and as many outbreedings of, generally, of general adaptability organic equipment, the progeny evolved into porpoises and later into whales. Okay, sorry. Any, any comments Thanks, and uh, questions, actually? No, or... yeah, well, I haven't actually read that. I don't remember reading that page before. I have read Critical Path, but not from cover to cover. I read it in bits and pieces. Do not remember reading that page. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it was actually kind of, um, I was actually trying to think about it myself uh, in terms of really after millions of years and favorable environmental conditions. That's what I was thinking more than anything mm -hmm. else. Um, you know, it could become feasible to telescan and assemble humans on Earth. Uh, and I don't, you know, I, I was wondering if anybody had any thoughts on that in particular. Uh, because I actually I'm trying to see what the objective is with that. Well, he's talking about evolution, I think, the development of human beings. I mean, so far we haven't got to human beings. He talks about human beings. He talks about lagoon frolicking male and female human swimmers gradually inbred into porpoises and later into whales. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think is in a broad sense uh describing here that there is a purpose in nature hmm. is talking teleologically and one of the things that was very important that john read is the complex angle frequency programming you always talk about that we only have can do uh two um, modulations, angle modulation and frequency modulation. Angle modulation is amplitude. Frequency modulation is, as they say, the divisions. You get what, is, uh, what I'm saying here? Yeah. He, he talked about that. So, so there is there is something that is a process that is going on. And that process is programming with angle and frequency modulation. And doing it progressively to learn, as you say, into where the universe needs harvesters, information harvesters, uh, winnowers and transmitters in the service of his uh, eternally regenerative 
character. Okay. Um, any comments? Shall we or continue. Shall we mm. continue? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that, Manu. <clears throat> okay. Speculative prehistory of humanity. Intimately relevant to these fundamental reorientings of our speculative prehistory of humans present aboard planet Earth, we have the, hollow, the following hard fact scientific discovery. Vitamin D from sunlight is essential to humans because milk provided calcium is essential to the human bone structure. Vitamin D functions in the conversion of calcium into bone structure. Two, humans synthesize vitamin D through the action of the sun's ultraviolet rays on the skin. This biochemical function is zoological counterpart of botanical photosynthesis of sun radiation into hydrocarbon molecules. But vitamin D is one of those vitamins of which humans can have an overdose. In warmer and tropical climes where vitamin D from the sun is adequate or excessive, humans subconsciously functioning organisms employing their chemical process options develop sunlight filters in the skin consisting of darker and darker pigments which prevent excess absorption of radiation and avoid the overdose of vitamin D. Where there is not much sunlight as in the far north, human organisms had to progressively remove their skin pigment filters, which left only blonde skin permitting maximum synthesis of vitamin D from the sun. Vitamin D is not naturally present in most foods. The one food in which it is significantly present is whale blubber, a food of the Eskimos. Because of long periods of darkness and the large amounts of clothing the Eskimos wear to protect them, from the cold sunlight synthesized vitamin from the cold, sunlight synthesized vitamin D is not available in enough quantities to the Eskimos. The two chief human organism supplied skin pigments that filter the sun's rays are melanin, brown and black skin, keratin, oriental, yellow skin. In confirmation of all the foregoing, we note the white and pink skin bottoms of the feet and palms of hands of otherwise dark or black skinned individuals, white because not exposed to sun and therefore unable to photosynthesize vitamin D from the sun, therefore not protectively colored by melanin or keratin filters. Biology. You comment on that, if we can. Please do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, coming to that fact, you know, the first thing is that what he's describing here is a kind of uh, state of balance of things, where under certain conditions, vitamin D, vitamin D from the sunlight is synthesized by the body in a way that is in balance, is not overdosed. But today, with a change of lifestyles and things like that. And what we eat, we realize that the most incidence of, of uh, deficiency in vitamin D is amongst black people. Is that right? Did you know mm. that? No, I didn't actually. That's the highest incidence of deficiency in vitamin D because of lifestyle. You get me? There has been a brutal mm. change of lifestyle where people are more in offices. Mm. Right. Right? They, are not, they haven't got enough exposure to sun. That is one. But further, there's a change into what their intake. Many of the nutrients from vitamin D were to be in some of the plants, some of the food that we eat, we don't. So we need to supplement in this lifestyle and those who can supplement. Anyway, before you start supplementing, you have to be diagnosed 
And is imagine, at least where I am, that a lot of deficiencies in vitamin D is among black people. The incidence is high. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting what I'm taking away from these past two passages or groups, uh, you know, of, um, that we had just read is specifically how detailed Bucky is in actually going through the evolutionary process. And the reason this is so important is because we start to see the interconnected uh ness of everything of nature itself and when we start to think about in terms of systems and how we function in the world uh we can start to see um what our actions you know how they actually have how they've evolved and what our future actions may how they may impact us and the office is a perfect example of how we can have a vitamin D deficiency um, because now we're in front of computers or in offices all the time. So that these are these are the the cascading effects um, that you know happen uh, over time, and and so these we're starting to see how uh, things emerge. Uh, and whenever we're doing a systems analysis of any sort, uh, which is essentially what Bucky's always thinking about, uh, especially within in terms of nature, um, it's important to understand all aspects of nature. Uh, and um, we have tendencies to, in today's world, to look at things uh, in parts. Mm. and and so the reason i appreciate this is that it doesn't jump off the page to me as like okay you know this where is this headed but i tend to think of things in trade i tend to think of things and and how the global economy works i tend to think of things about how everything is is interconnected in a uh in a very narrow sense but just going through what we just went through with what you know Manu you know who has pretty much knows everything um that it's 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 essentially giving us uh you know an idea of one what holistic thinking is but two um what it really means to actually think about evolution and how systems evolve over time uh, as opposed to just looking at it from one uh, perspective, which is the way or uh, that we've been trained many times, uh, at least in school. I think anyway, those also, are just some of my things. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. It also furthers, you know, to remind us of the danger of staying into one thought and mm -hmm. thinking that that thought is eternal. You know, you see, black people, they've got education and information that, you know, their black skin is caused by an abundance of the conversion of vitamin D. I mean, vitamin D playing a big role. And they, and they, and they translate that into, we don't need to look after that aspect of our lives, we find, right? You see, white mm -hmm. people will go onto the beach mm -hmm. and seek sun all the time. And this, over time, translates into those things that we see today, which at first sight do not correspond to what we know. I mean, we all thought that the black guy, right, wouldn't have, we made an association of the role of vitamin D and not the role of vitamin D, we know the importance of vitamin D in the functioning of the body. And we take it for granted that those conditions that prevail in the past are still valid today, even though 
the local conditions have changed drastically. And we do that, and uh, it doesn't yield the result that we expect. Mm. Yeah. And, and the deficiency in vitamin D translates into high incidence of cancer, you know, many, many other stuff. Remember that we are a complex system. So if there is a pin that drops or that doesn't work properly, that's not at, you know, peg at, 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 at the appropriate level, then there's a lot of other consequences that emerge. Okay. No, I, I and I couldn't agree more. Um, and the other thing that that does is that, and you talked about the consequences, is just, and I thought about it in terms um, of how this works with a stoic framework in the sense that there is a physics, uh, ethics, and a logic. That's the framework for, for, for stoicism, essentially, for a philosophy of life, for the stoics. And understanding cause and effect is part of that. And understanding the consequences of all our actions for both, you know, our physical and mental health uh, is essential for the ethics because ethics is broadly defined as living a good life. And, you know, living a good life, part of that is overcoming obstacles, but it, at the same time, trying to maintain our health to a certain degree so that we can actually um, support one another as best way, as best possible. So understanding these things, understanding the consequences of our actions, and when we introduce a new technology and understanding all the value trade-offs uh, is essential um, to our ability to um, serve each other. Uh, you know, so I, I mean, this is where knowledge is, you know, kind of wisdom. It, and it is wisdom. Uh, so understanding these things, I, again, I, you know, I read these pages, it's kind of, it's, 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 it was initially, okay, what, where's Pucky going with this? But then you really start to see, this is what holistic thinking really is, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, um, him jumping right into, uh, you know, any other area. It's actually looking at how the physical body, how we evolved, period. And um, and so I appreciate the 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 uh, the um, detail by which he actually goes into this because uh, it's something that we necessarily don't we we take for granted anyway. So understanding cause and effect is essential. So, any other comments or questions? The last comment that I'd like to put here is that it's just putting in practice to start it from the general first before dipping into, diving into the micro. Start from macro and go to the micro. Hmm. Thank you for that. I was thinking about that earlier today, actually. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, John, would you mind uh, continuing? continuing not at all. Yep. Biology Thank demonstrates you. a botanical counterpart of the foregoing zoological sun utilizing and filtering strategies for the sun intensity filtering strategies manifest in the Earth's hardwoods. The most northerly are white oak, southward of which we come to the pink oak and light yellow birch. As we go further south, we see the pink pearl maple and gray ash then the deep red-yellow southern pine, south of which occur the brown mahoganies and dark grey teak, and further south, the dark brown rosewoods, with the spectrum change terminating at the equator in the black ebony. Wow. Compound this information with the fact that only for the last short decade in all of human history have we learned through incontrovertible scientific evidence 
that undernourishment of a child during its station, during its gestation in the womb or in its first year of life most frequently results in damage to the human brain. The damage may often be just a mild dulling or slowness of wit or an otherwise seemingly human, sorry, of an otherwise seemingly healthy human. Throughout all known history, the powerful fighting kings and noble stock reserved exclusively to, exclusively to themselves all animal flesh derived from their hunting. The poor people had to make do with the local roots, nuts and fruits, which due to the vagaries of special environments often contained a range of chemical ingredients inadequate to healthy nourishment. The animals, on the other hand, ate of the vegetation in general and uh, of other animals' flesh, some totally acquiring a comprehensively broad input of the full gamut of chemistries essential to a healthy diet. It, uh, Karl we, Marx. I, yeah, sure. I was just going to make one quick, very brief comment based on this. Is this that uh, uh, this is the other? There's two things that had come to mind. Is that where uh, we start to understand what it takes to have a healthy human and human being and and the nourishment that requ is required at a young age um and that drives our ethics uh so that we start to understand like what we need to do uh in order to ensure that someone is um uh you know maintaining a healthy lifestyle but there's also the fact that uh, it starts early. It's 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 no longer about managing. Um, uh, it, it's being it's taking a more holistic approach to our health overall, and it and it's and it's 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 essentially setting up people to be healthy over a long period of time, and this could reduce costs overall. Uh, it's just a question of basically thinking about it in terms of. Uh, uh, systems, and then you start to see the ethical concerns that come into play. Anyway, that's all uh, of a healthy diet. I'm sorry to interrupt, John. You're right. So, um, so throughout all known history, the powerful fighting kings and noble stock reserved exclusively to themselves all animal flesh derived from their hunting. The poor people had to make do with the local roots, nuts, and fruits, which due to the vagaries of special environments, often contained a range of chemical ingredients inadequate to healthy nourishment. The animals, on the other hand, ate of the vegetation in general and of other animals' flesh, some totally acquiring a comprehensively broad input of the full gamut of chemistries essential to a healthy diet. Karl Marx, bespeaking the workers, assumed the working class to be innately different from the noble class, he and other defenders of the working class assumed that the workers and the nobles were of different organic and blood stock. The nobles also assumed this to be true and required that the nobles intermarry with other nobles. Both nobles and workers assumed that experience taught them there is a fundamental inadequacy of the life support in this world. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. No, it is. Yeah, the comment word. or question. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Notice that okay. garbage in the system, garbage out. Yes. Because of a fundamental assumption. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the result, what the output is going to be in accordance with that fundamental axiom. That is, there's inadequacy of results. Mm -hmm. So we draw conclusion on the basis of things that were very partial and we are right. surprised by the result or we take them as fundamental whereas they're not yeah and actually this even the way Karl Marx was actually thinking uh, in terms of just nobles and working class is partial uh, to your point uh, Manu in the sense that it's partial in the sense that he didn't include a third class, which is actually the entrepreneurial class, yeah. which are those individuals that can actually then become nobles. And yeah. what happens is that that's the system that allows things to die and regenerate. So if you allow, if you allow damn things to die. 
Uh, yeah. So I'm talking about banks and things like that. And that's mm -hmm. nature in the sense that the way it, it evolves. Um, but with by breaking it down just as these two classes, um, you're saying that, well, here's a limited number of resources and these two classes are essentially, that's it. And, um, uh, and this is where you fit in the system. And the world doesn't, nature does not work like that. Uh, so, you know, it's, I, I never, I'm not one to sit here and, um, to always be the one that, you know, kind of, um, that blasts Karl Marx, because I think he was trying to solve a problem to a certain, you know, to a certain degree. Uh, you know, I understand that he, uh, but I, I think he failed in, in, in not necessarily considering the whole. Uh, and I think that this, this resulted in not looking to nature and looking only in categories. Uh, so I think that was a very big problem. And this is where we started. To, I actually had a conversation about this and I'm rethinking my whole idea. Um, I don't know. There's the, the theory of creative destruction uh, with Joseph Schumpeter um, that kind of talks about the third class of entrepreneurs. Um, but uh, I was having a good conversation about somebody with this. Um, the there's destruction and construction, but it's not necessarily creativity. And that's the creativity I'm I'm seeing as something that is more in line with Bucky's thinking where you're making connections and actually creating something new. You're not necessarily reconstructing something. Mm. Uh, and so that I'm working on that insight, uh, but it was a very interesting insight that I had earlier this week. Uh, but the, you know, anyway, the long and short of this is that this is binary thinking and it shows you the, the difficulties with that. I think, I think that there are some, if I were to define, if I rule the world, like somebody said, there will be two things. One will be that, for us to agree that the most fundamental axiom of a world is that unity is plural at the minimum of two. Mm. It is to me so fundamental. That is the highest level of generalization. Unity is plural at the minimum of two. And the second question is that of, is as mundane as appropriation. You know, everywhere in the world, in parliament, they talk about appropriation bills. In that, mm -hmm. really the problem is less of creativity. You know, like creativity will happen because we always divide and we need to put them together. The problem is this one, the yields of creativity how is it appropriated? I'm not just talking about the small first order year. I'm talking about the conditions of even progress of other brethren. Is the exchange, as Kelly would say, is it empathic? Mm. You know, it's very difficult to make accept those principles, but that's it. Unity is plural at the minimum of two on the one hand, and because it needs a corollary to make that two, the appropriation need to be empathic. And with that, you internalize the contradiction that seem to be external to the thoughts of people like Karl Marx or the nobles as, as Bucky says, or other class stuff. Because if I realize that the air that I breathe is probably going to be the same air that John breathed <laughs> in Australia, I don't know how many 
time zones away from here, and that Joe breathes, you know, 14 hours, 13 hour flight, you know, from Cape Town to Washington, DC. The flight is probably 15 hours, mm. direct flight. You understand what I'm trying to say? So, yes. yes. If, we, if we know that, then we'll be able to operate better at the micro level in a way that we coexist. Yeah. Again, that comes back to the interconnected nature that we're it talking about. So, it is yeah. one system, it's not two systems. It, right, exactly. It's one system, not two systems. And um, yeah, and, and it, it's one system and, it, and yeah, we start dividing, as you mentioned, and breaking these categories down. Um, and then we wonder why they don't necessarily work. Yeah. Because uh, eh, anyway. Remember, Joe, that as soon as you divide, what happens? In terms of principle, what happens? Um, it becomes closed. Well, as soon as you divide, in terms of principle, dividing me mean putting a boundary. Yeah, boundary. Okay, that's, that's what that's it what means. As soon as you put your boundary, energy flows in and out. That's the general principle. As soon as there is a boundary, you define the inside and the outside of a system. And energy is always flowing, is the first principle, isn't it? Right. Energy is always flowing. So energy is going to flow. Whatever you want or not is going to flow in the form of pollution, in the form of imbalances that are going to appear in the system. If you try to keep it static. Yeah. Actually, that's a very so good boundaries point. are like rooms of a house. That's all it is. It is still the same house. Can you say what you said about it being or expanded? What do you mean by it being static? Because I think that that's critical. Because no, the I'm fact saying, is that the... yeah, I'm saying as a general principle, we know that dividing is putting a boundary. Right. But the dual of the bonding is that there is flow of energy. The two always coexist. Right. right? Right. If there's no division, there's no flow of energy because energy wouldn't go from one place to the other. Energy flows from one place to the other. Where there are differences, it flow from high pressure to low pressure. Right? That's right. Okay, so, and, and it flows because there's a division. So the two always coexist. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to replicate socially what is going on in nature and we divide, if we don't consider those divisions are just chambers of the same house where more specialized things are going to be done, but contributing to the system for it to continue as a house, there's going to be a problem because you are under a general principle. If you try to hold tight the room, well, <clears throat> the other are going to conspire. The other rooms are going to conspire against that room. So yes. in other words, there's going to be a lot of friction and a lot of conflict. I'm just trying to illustrate how you go from general principles into the thing that happened and see how the general principle help us understand more generally, you know, the situations. And when you come to working on the micro, on the local, we can be sharper for the time that is required to be sharp and less sharp when it's required because the two always exist. It's always phases, cycles.
That actually makes that, that makes things much much clearer for me. This, it, that example in particular. Um, so I very much appreciate that. Um, are you complete, Manu? Yeah. Are you? I was just saying, or if you're complete, then uh, John, would you complete. mind? I don't want. Yes. No, this is actually very. This is. I'm thinking about this, and this made this particular passage is going to be very helpful for me in the future. Now, where are we up to? The workers' leaders. Is that where we're up to? That's, that's yes. correct. Yeah. The workers' leaders. After that, after that paragraph, no. No, I don't think we'd read that. No, no, I think okay. we we haven't read that. No, we haven't read that paragraph. That. The workers I don't remember spontaneous, assume yeah. that the spontaneous familiarization of the workers with tools and farming made them the fittest to survive. They considered the nobles to be parasites. Finding themselves on the top of the heap, the nobles assumed that their venturesomeness, wit, courage, muscle and skill at arms had obviously rendered them the fittest to survive. The workers' leaders assumed that if the workers could successfully organise themselves to be the class to survive, they must exterminate all those of the aristocratic blood. Since the discovery that infantile undernourishment was alone responsible for the dulling of the human workers' brains, we have discovered that there is no organic blood class or species differentiation of humans. Wow. Compounding the latter information and that governing skin pigmentation, we discover that by scientific evidence, there is neither race nor class differentiation of humans. All humans are of the same family. All mm. physiognomic and other physiological differentiations in human appearance are the exclusive consequences of multi generations of unplanned inbreeding of those types that survived most successfully under unique environmental conditions within which local geographies, tribes, or nations dwelt for protracted periods. The USSR had 146 different nations to integrate into their republic. Those nations had been geographically isolated and inbred so long that their local survival types looked physically different from members of the other nations. Okay, so basically we're all the same. We have had four known ice ages. They average a million years apiece. The intervals between them average a quarter of a million years. Together, they cover a known total of four and three quarter million years. The Leakey family's proofs of the presence of humans on our planet for over three million years take us back through two ice ages and two inter-ice age intervals to the end of the second ice age. As an ice age develops, more and more of the Earth's water is frozen which greatly lowers the ocean level and reveals previously hidden interconnecting land masses. At the time of the last ice age's occurrence, the sea hidden inter island connections revealed themselves as continental isthmuses and peninsulas. The great islands of Java, Sumatra, Borneo, the Philippines, Sulawesi, and Bali became integral parts of the Malay Peninsula. New Guinea was part of continental Australia. Alaska and Siberia were connected. The expanding ice mantle drove the northern continent's fur-skinned wild animals southward into the new peninsular extensions of the Asiatic mainland. The surprised once islanded natives learned gradually to cope with these animals. Hunted some, dominated others such as sheep and goats and mounted road or directed some such as horses, mules, elephants and water buffaloes. As the ice age withdrew, melting ice filled the oceans and seas and the islands became once more isolated, but they were now inhabited with wild animals. Tigers as yet are found in West Bali, Western Bali. At great mountain altitudes where the temperatures were low, the ice caps remained, most notably on the high Himalaya range. 
in the vast ice cap of the Himalayas, water melted to produce great rivers that flowed seaward from the five mile high frozen reservoir. Because the atoll incubated original human life had come naturally to invent rafts and boats that became their natural transport. When the waters receded, they used those boats to bridge the increasing distance between the once interconnected lands. Boats being their natural transport, they dug canals into the muddy mainland coast as it became progressively uncovered. Flying above the coast of Thailand and Cambodia today, one can see the myriad of geometrically neat ancient canals that penetrated their sea coast. These two primitive conditions, ocean water covering or permeating the land and the melted waters flowing seaward from the ice cap mountains produced in the course of history two very different types of hydrocultures. Those of the islanded sea people and those of the inland and upland travelled and settled people. The sea people's major waters were salty. The inland and upland people's major waters were fresh. The inland people frequently came to fresh water, whereas the boat and island people only infrequently came upon freshwater sources. The sea, boat and island people tended to anticipate their freshwater needs more than the inland and mountain people. The atoll people, it must be remembered, had an absolute necessity for potable fresh water. And fortunately, from time to time, they found it coursing down their mountainsides from high altitude rain filled lakes. We note that the island people were originally planet landed peoples who originally explored widely with their paddled canoes and gradually settled inland and upland, being able to cope with the mountain coldness because of their new animal skin clothing and tents fashioned from the skins of wild animals that roamed into their peninsula interbridged islands during the last ice age. The great architectural feature of Bali is that of the narrow vertical gap in the gateways of their walled in dwelling compounds, a gap they explain as representing the gap that occurred long ago between once united Bali and Java. Can you move that chair? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I lost audio for a moment. Um, okay, so I just went, where were you up to, Joe? We were up to, uh, I got up to the now ver uh, vertical gap. And so, uh, I mean, if you, any, if, do you have any comments? Um, uh, any comments or que uh, questions that anybody wants to raise uh, over what we just read? Um, yeah. Anything in particular stick out? The only thing that actually stuck out to me is a little bit up. Uh, I'll just say what Manu, I, I guess maybe Manu was almost reading ahead when he said that uh, it was. Wow, you're going, going back far, eh? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to go back that far, actually. So why don't we just keep going? It was, um, yeah, it, it was just something about the Marx comment, but. Yeah, here we are. Here we yeah. are. Um, in the gateways of their walled in dwelling compounds, a gap they explain as representing the gap that occurred long ago between once united Bali and Java. This occurred only 30,000 years ago when the last ice age began to melt away and its waters once again separated the islands. The Balinese architectural legend supported memory thus goes back 30,000 years. Whenever I fly over Cambodia and Thailand and see the canal patterns penetrating for hundreds of miles into the land, I cannot suppress the intuition that, in addition to being the atoll water people's first entry into the main river mouths, these canals were also where these people began to work the mainlands. Having learned so much about hydraulic flows with the come and go of tides into island lagoons and basins, those first inland and upland paddlers were able to carry their hydraulic thinking up into the mainland hills and mountains. Of course, the sun also was always elevating fresh water into the air, first by evaporation and then by condensation at the cold heights, where after gravity pulled it again earthward, 
distributing it over wide areas as wind propelled rain clouds. Condensation is electrolytic. The atoll water people learned millions of years ago that wood floated, that one log rolled over in the water, and that two logs with their branches intertwined no longer rolled in the water. From this, they learned that two parallel logs properly boomed and tied together at a little distance, not only produced a stable craft, but one that with the leaves of its branches sewn together and intuitively angled would sail almost into the leaves of it. with the leaves of its branches sewn together and intuitively angled would sail most almost into the wind in learning to tie their logs and spars together to withstand great strains imposed by winds and waves these atoll people learned that triangles are the only structurally stable patterns for the interbracings outriggings and sparring of their sailing canoes and catamarans these fishing people had great need for strong baskets to contain their fish and other. I think you might have gone a little bit too quickly, Joe. I did. I'm sorry about that. That picture messed me up. Okay, hang on, hang on. These fishing people had great need for strong baskets to contain their fish and other vital supplies when trafficking between islands and later to capture and secure the animals when the latter invaded them during the Ice Ages. It is historically noteworthy that amongst all the South Pacific Islands peoples and all the coastal peoples from Japan southward to Burma, all their baskets, small and large, are triangularly 60 degree, three way woven, while all the basketry of the rest of the world is square or 90 degree, two way woven. This sole exception is the three way woven baskets found at the northern end of the Andes in South America just inland from where the Japanese current would have carried the water people's drifting rafts. None of these same water people, as a great Austronesian observer, Austin Coates, brilliantly discovered, understand the Western world's bank. Nope. Sorry about that. It's, it's whenever I touch it and if it, it just goes all the way down. Um, In a second. There we go. So it starts here. Okay. Speculative prehistory of humanity. I don't know if Steve. No, actually... we still did it. Go back a little time. Yeah. Hang on. yeah, I'm trying to. Where are we? Back a little bit. Just above that. Uh, so it's right there. None of these. Yeah. None of these same water people understand the Western world's bank. Okay. Oh, banking. Banking and credit finance businesses. As a consequence, four Chinese families run all the banking businesses of Java and Sumatra and Indonesia in general. These Southeast Asians say the banker cannot lend them the wind before the wind blows. They are right. As the world's bankers are about to learn to the unprecedented discomfort of all humanity. Let's just let's stop and analyze that. So four Chinese families run all the banking in Java, Sumatra, and Indonesia. But the Asians say the banker cannot lend them the wind before the wind blows. Okay. They are right, as the world's bankers are about to learn to the unprecedented discomfort of all humanity. Everyone who has visited the rice cultures of Japan and Southeast Asia has witnessed the vast and meticulous hydraulic engineering of the mountain and valley side rice paddy system flowing horizontally and multi-directionally at each level as the waters are gradually brought seaward from great heights with never a chance missed to make foods and flowers grow along the way. These beautiful levelings and infinitely delicate controllings of water flow must have been of the greatest importance to human survival over many millennia, if not for millions of years. So, Our speculative prehistory identifies the terraced rice paddy development as the most complete in the world, occurring as a consequence of there being boat and island people who have learned by experience the critical function freshwater plays in life. 
their experiences taught them to become most anticipatorily effective through artifacts, the rice paddy being an artifact, in avoiding lack of fresh water. This leads to our prognostication that the next era of important anthropological research will occur in coral reefs. Up to a decade ago, archaeologists, anthropologists, geologists, um, biologists, yes, Manu. Uh, so I think Manu has a question or a comment or a question. Yep. I was just going to comment that this is where Becky, I would say, on the shoot into, mm. yeah, because it didn't anticipate what these bankers can do. Right? Mm. Because the banker is there to preserve a status, mm. control and preserve. And his Bucky's thing is you have to be anticipatorily in such a way that you have designs that precisely take care of the situation. Mm. It's like instant thing that will mm. happen. You know, if you design properly, the future will take care of itself, mm. right? That seems to be his proposition. But what mm. we see today is, is that in spite of all the progresses, or all the progress in uh, technology, in artificial intelligence, in computing, in whatever we want, is still captured in a way. So the bankers are still capturing because they have other, you know, like you see, you see the excesses of credit in the world or debt. Yep. Right. We arrive at a level where you have just too big to fail. Well, <laughs> that's <laughs> actually the opposite, I think, Manu. They're, they're too big to succeed. If we just stop and talk about banking for a minute. Um, we have governments and businesses, big businesses, trying to stamp out the use of cash. Mm. Governments are trying to outlaw the use of cash and to make all banking electronic and through banks because it gives them control of money. It's actually crime that makes the greatest use of cash now. We regularly have criminals apprehended, particularly drug dealers, with millions of dollars in cash. And so um, the, the, it's going to provide further justification. The government will argue that only those involved in crime need cash. If you're a legitimate law-abiding tax-paying citizen, you're better off, you're safe, your money can't be stolen from you if it's in the banks. I think there's a contradiction in that, but anyway, um, that you give your money to the banks, the banks will take care of it, they'll protect it, it can't be stolen from you. But then if the government and the banks decide to deny you access to your money, as has happened a number of times already, you need to go to an ATM and the ATMs don't work and you can't access your money. And you are completely at the control of the government. So it frightens me to think that the majority of people will not have cash. They will be completely dependent on electronic banking. If computers go down or are corrupted, if governments or banks stop ATMs from operating, people will have no access to their money. Yep. And that can already happen. We're seeing the excesses. I mean, we see the US, Bucky said, was um, insolvent when he was writing The Grunch of Giants in 1982. We've just seen in the last week the brinkmanship that now comes in the way their political system structured where the government needs the opposition support to be able to spend more money. And the sorts of um, price that's being extracted for that agreement. And the Republicans already have rabid Republicans who are saying that the more reasonable Republicans were wrong to agree to what they agreed to with the Democrats. So we have tension within the Republicans. Um, it scares me because, as everybody acknowledges, if the US becomes openly insolvent, then that will have a huge impact on business, commerce, currencies, banks around the world. And again, those most likely to be hurt, as during the GFC, are the poor. The poor mm -hmm. lost their homes. 
the wealthy made more money. And those who were criminals, but, but, but white collar criminals didn't go to jail. There might have been one or two sacrificial lambs, but most of them just wound up even better off after the GFC than they were before. So it just, is... Uh, hmm. let look at it this, let's look at it this way. Huh? I first take it at the level of the poor will lose their savings and things like that. And I, I go back to the 60s. Mm -hmm. And you get measurement of things. The poor have lost all. By any measure, anybody, whether it is inside countries or across all countries in the world, the poor have had their purchasing power divided oh, by eroded. Yes, eroded. eroded, you know, to one third or 20% of what it was in the 70s. I'm talking about the real purchasing power. Hmm. That's one point, okay. The second point is, we know that in every system, if you tweak, you can only tweak for a while. Hmm. Let's just talk about death ceiling. You cannot be moving the target all the time. You will never sure. land. And this has been all over the world, mainly in the US, for so long that every time every president that comes negotiate some kind of raising a death ceiling, it means that you are diluting whatever it is that is real, the counterpart of that debt to zero. Mm. It just, it just, it just, uh, uh, how you call it, tangentially going to zero. Hmm. The third thing is this one. The system as it exists, we know that we are in debt that way because of speculation. It's not a debt for producing goods and services. It's not a debt in support of producing things that will serve us is a debt to suffer of resources from the most, of, most often simple-minded people that believe in hard work, savings, right? Suffer mm -hmm. into speculation. Everybody is a trader today. Who's producing? Everybody, I'm saying without exception, is a trader. So we believe in capital gains and in capital gains that are in contradiction to one of the fundamentals that capital accumulate gradually. We want it now and we trade it to death. So those three things mean, yes, the system will, have, will not fail for those who have, but it has already failed for those who haven't got. So we need to reform, absolutely to reform the system. I mean, look at the US. In 1933, trying to kind of put some limit on the glass tiger, by, by the glass tiger act, you know, to between speculative and the more traditional, how would I call it? Uh, call it family banking, if you want. Mm -hmm. Retail. Yes. But every government has used every mean to erode, erode, erode the glass tiger, taking out some teeth from it until Clinton in 1998 or 1999, I can't remember when, just say to hell with it and move it, allowing further speculation that came in full blown with money printing from Alan Greenspan in the early 80s, after the, what do you call it, the, 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 the South Asia emerging market flu or whatever, it's just been printing machine. So, so there is a big problem, a big problem that I don't know how it's going to be solved, but it has to be solved. Uh, 
I, I, I agree with you, Manu. I mean, there's one thing. <coughs> I'm sorry, were you complete? Yes, I'm complete. I'm complete. Okay. I agree with you 100%. I think that there is something um, important here um, that uh, I think of Glass-Steagall, and I just thought about this not too long ago, maybe in our one of our past conversations. Uh, it shows you the impact. It's like a trim tab for negative purposes. It's a small change that had massive impact. And that's one thing I think sometimes when we talk about uh, uh, anticipatory design, um, sustainable design, and technology in particular, I think that Bucky thinks and he does that these are these are tools that will overtake poor decisions by banks and governments and i don't think that that's true no personally and so that's where i kind of see where bucky overvalued technology a little bit in utopian oblivion specifically mm. And so knowing that we can redesign and we can we can come up with solutions to um, problems, but it doesn't change the fact that, you know, we have, a, and I think you put it beautifully when you said there's a debt um, that produces things that don't serve us. Mm. And I think that that's a, that that's a very it's an accurate statement. Um, we're doing more with less, but we still have a lot of the same issues. Mm. And I think that um, to be perfectly honest, I think we have to figure out more. We instead of just thinking about how to completely redesign a system sometimes, not that that's, that's something that's absolutely needed, don't get me wrong. I think we need to start thinking in terms of trim tabs. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the way uh, things can change so that systems redesign can occur. Uh, so that's just my thought. And, I, and if we think about the profound impact that the removal of glass Eagle was at, uh, what it meant for the banking sector, what it meant um, for the housing sector, what it meant for accountants with Sarbanes-Oxley and things like that, what it's meant for um, you know, a, a whole set of, and this comes back to the whole, what we were talking about earlier. Uh, it's understanding that how things are interconnected. Um, I, 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 I think it's, it's just something where, uh, we really need to think about small changes that have huge impacts. Yeah versus actually thinking about complete systems redesign and think about systems redesign but only after how you're going to get in there and like from a 90 degree angle mm -hmm. that's just my thought i know that you know but sometimes when we you try the old saying is to boil the ocean doesn't necessarily work yeah what I will add is that it takes great courage because seeing Bucky talking like, remember that he's talking like this during the height of the Cold War. Yeah. It takes oh, courage yeah. to stand and support your ideas, you know, in the sea of people thinking otherwise and acting otherwise. It really takes courage. He gave us the blueprint, yeah. I think, 
to to do all the things that need to be done, including models that actually worked in reality. Um, so from that perspective, you know, that's why Bucky's a pioneer. Um, we just got to figure out the execution task part. Hmm. <clears throat> and we had, you know, anyway, governments and debt, I think, are not necessarily just, they, they don't just get overtaken. Well, I think we may see a lot of conflict. Let's I move on, not. see what comes out of this. Our speculative prehistory identifies the terraced rice paddy development as the most complete in the world, occurring as a consequence of there being boat and island people who have learned by experience the critical function freshwater plays in life. Their experiences taught them to become most anticipatorily effective through artifacts, the rice paddy being an artifact, in avoiding lack of fresh water. This leads to our prognostication that the next era of important anthropological research will occur in coral reefs. Up to a decade ago, archaeologists, anthropologists, geologists, biologists, and historians of world around affairs placed the beginnings of human life on Earth and Scripture's Garden of Eden, somewhere east of Suez, close to but eons before ancient Babylon, which itself is in the heart of the Great Valley of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in ancient Mesopotamia. The historical experts assumed that humanity's graduation from the Stone Age into the Bronze Age also occurred in Asia Minor. This assumption rested largely on the copper found on the large historically strategic island of Cyprus, lying just off the eastern Mediterranean coast of Asia Minor. The name Cyprus comes from the Latin cuprus, meaning copper. Bronze, however, oh. is made of copper and tin. Copper as a metal is soft and not very good for weapons or tools. So too is tin. Bronze is hard, resilient and excellent for weapons and tools. Historians and archaeologists seem to be extraordinarily poor metallurgist because early bronze items were found in Asia Minor in the vicinity of Cyprus. They misconcluded that it was there that the Bronze Age began. But the oldest metals discovering, developing and trading records known to humanity on our planet are the meticulously accurate data of the Phoenicians. Their detailed records tell us that they had to sail hundreds of miles westward out of the Mediterranean into the Atlantic and then northward for more hundreds of miles to what we call today the British Isles to get the tin occurring exclusively on those islands, then bringing it back to Asia Minor where it was combined with Cyprus copper to make bronze. Until 1950, there is no historical record of humanity inventing metallurgical alloys. All metallurgical alloys have always been accidentally discovered. The alloy occurs as symmetrically stable arrangements of atoms, invisible to naked human eyes, happen to come into critical proximity under the right heat conditions to produce their common liquidity. No one could foresee that combining soft copper with even softer tin could and would produce stiff, hard, resilient bronze. Tin and copper had to co-occur geologically in the same geographical area to be the subject to accidental melting together. To me, it is absolutely impossible that the beginnings of the Bronze Age could have occurred in Asia Minor. The bronze was produced there tells us that some Asia Minor people learned about bronze making from others who earlier and elsewhere had discovered it accidentally. Overland caravans from the Orient to Asia Minor experienced the uses of bronze and learned that it was an alloy of copper and tin. Then having learned from overseas explorers and traders that tin occurred in the British Isles, the Cyprus neighboring Phoenicians set about to import it to Asia Minor. It was incidentally the tin in the British Isles that induced Julius Caesar to, Caesar to build a highway all the way from Rome to the English Channel and thereafter to settle Romans in England until the tin was nearly exhausted. 
In this connection, it is importantly relevant to note that we now know that much earlier in history, the Phoenicians navigated and traded the Indian Ocean and visited Thailand, which we now know was where bronze was first produced. Approximately 17 years ago, 1964, highly artful bronze castings were discovered in northeast Thailand in an area called Ban Chung. In that area, tin and copper co-occur abundantly, but the two could have been melted together accidentally. In Ban Chung, we have found early pottery of unprecedented and artfully delighting design. This pottery required the magnitude of heat necessary to alloy copper and tin. Both have low melting points. The same metallurgically naive historians already mentioned had assumed the Bronze Age civilization to have traveled eastward from Asia Minor all the way to China. Thereafter, the Chinese, whom those mistaken historians admit were very smart and apparently caught on fast, to the cultural attainments of Asia Minor, swiftly developed a highly cultivated civilization of their own, involving an enormous production of fine art bronzes. Then, said yesterday's experts, the bronze artists of northern China found their way down into Southeast Asia, a region considered by them to be a cultural Johnny come lately. You cannot use carbon 14 to prove the age of bronzes. But in 1977, metallurgists discovered ways of dating the ages of bronzes. In 1975, the Thai government placed the diggings at Ban Chiang in the charge of the Museum of the University of Pennsylvania, with the latter's archaeologist, Dr. Chet Gorman, in command. Dr. Gorman took many of the bronzes to Philadelphia and in due course developed ingenious means for arriving at the age of bronze objects and did so to the satisfaction of metallurgical scientists in general. These proofs showed that the bronzes of Ban Chiang are the earliest known on planet Earth. This news was published on the front page of the New York Times in the summer of 1977. We now know that the Bronze Age began in Southeast Asia. This reversal of historical theory greatly enhances our own speculative hypothesis that humanity originated in the Os. Tunisian islands and came out into the Asian mainland in separate stages, each occurring one of the last ice ages. This reversal of the basic history of civilization also lends further credence to my reversed Darwinian theory of evolution on planet Earth. Can we <clears throat> make comments then? Please, sure, yeah. yeah. Okay. The first comment is copper and tin, soft metals. Combined mm -hmm. using bronze, mm -hmm. right? It is not something that is evident. You know, who would think that you know soft soft is more soft? Mm -hmm. So this can only occur if the two were combined and combined in a way that the grains become like um, the machine like diamonds, precisely like that, to make it stronger. The second thing that he said was um, the Mediterranean, to have tin from England. I read somewhere that there are times in a year when the Mediterranean Sea is still. You know those times? Mm -mm. It's due to the fact that it's almost landlocked. You know, like when you have a Gibraltar, and that small, you know, the Gibraltar Strait. So at time, due to event on the Atlantic, there's not a lot of air movement around the Mediterranean basin. So it's very, very difficult to navigate, especially, you know, they didn't have motorized stuff. They used to have a, a, a they used rowers, they used uh, galleys yes. that powered by slaves. Yes. So it will have been, you know, I'm just wondering about the impact on that on the trip. And the, and, the, and the third thing that I want to put on here is the fact that carbon 14 
is not useful in dating bronze. Mm. Like it would not it would not be useful in dating diamonds. And do you know why? No. Because I think eh, is is it carbon 14 dating is based on the rate of decay of the material. They take the rate of decay and they estimate the amount of decay. From that, the rate of decay and amount of decay, they can deduct the time that is put to decay to that level, to have level basically. When you come to bronze, I think bronze does not decay mm. or decay very, very, very slowly. I mean, if you have if you have bronze on your on your door handle, you know you have door handles that have lasted for the past two hundred years. I mean, this is nothing in terms of what we're talking about. But bronze basically it doesn't rust. Do you have experience of bronze rusting, uh, John or Joe? I uh, know. No. Okay. So that's what I'm 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 speculating that it says carbon-14 is not effective in dating mm. bronze because bronze does not decay. And I know that carbon-14 for datation, the application is based on the decay, the decay rate of the material that is being considered. And then the fourth thing is how does this, this speculative, I've had that discussion before, how does it come together with the latest discoveries of the homo evolution, the homo sapiens? Basically, squarely, most of the artifacts, the remains, are in Africa, not somewhere else. The most ancient. Unless there is a source of there are two, I mean, there is one source in the other, in which case people will be different. But all the DNA, the genetics support, is support into one thing. The original, and I learned that, I, I read that, not I learned, I read that the way they look as descendants, is in natural fact knocking out some of the things as we go down. And that knocking down is in relationship to the distance from the source. And they can trace that for virtually all humans. In other words, the theory is that if, for example, is in East Africa, in the reef in East Africa, that Homo sapiens emerge and that is start migrating. It will be losing some characteristics without changing the fundamental. So in terms of genetic richness to the source, people that are closer to the source will still have all the material with the fluff. People who are further who have lost the fluff, but kept the essential that allows them to continue as the same species. So my question is, how does this uh, speculation sit with those discoveries? How does this speculation? Yeah, so that, the... his hypothesis here. Yeah. Hmm. Because he's saying, based, for example, based on that Bronze Age mm -hmm. datation and the things in the place, he put the origin of human in Southeast Asia. And he further right. says, and he further buttresses that by the fact that he was talking about something that 
that correspond to the current flow, the maritime current flow of a rafter, like we have taken the rafter people to somewhere in the extreme of Latin America, where you still found some stuff. I don't know, I can't remember what we were talking about previously. Well, I think we're about to go further into this, Manu. I think what we're leading yeah. into now is more detail. I, I do think it's interesting just to see, um, coming back to even talking about what we were a little bit earlier is the idea of the evolution aspect of it from a human perspective. Mm -hmm. But now we're just looking at it from a metals perspective. Uh, and we start to think about it in terms of today, we're now in a digital perspective. Uh, so, you know, you go from uh, bronze to steel to digital. Um, actually from stone. Yeah, actually you go from stone, that's a good point. From stone to that's, bronze, yes. Yeah, there, and and actually that's the process of ephemeralization if you're looking at a generalized principle. Um, you're doing more and more with less and less. Uh, essentially, if you're building a bridge, uh, you know, that's one way that you're building it with um, instead of uh, um, like, uh, what was the example? I'm sorry. It's escaping me right now. Basically, you could do it with tubes and 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 uh, steel cables. You're you're using less steel even in the bridges that you're actually put, uh, building, mm -hmm. um, as you can redesign them, and, mm -hmm. and so you're starting to do more with less. Mm -hmm. And each age has its own, mm -hmm. um, and even digital. You know, the idea of how cloud computing, we're doing more with less. Mm. Um, this is just as a generalized principle, what you're seeing is how Bucky applies these things. Mm -hmm. and I mean, to his credit is that, is that this, the whole of this is predates all the, the rough of the latest discoveries. Mm -hmm. You know, Bucky is, is in the 70s, but Lucy, Lucy, the first humanoid, really the ancient, most ancient humanoid that was discovered in Abyssinia, that is in Ethiopia today, was in the, I think it was like 1980, 82, 83. Berkey just died. So he never had the time to take that information to revise whatever or to support whatever that was his theory. Yeah, but but he put, but he provided the foundation and the generalized principles that we need to to figure that yeah, out. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. Um, John, do you? Yeah. I'm happy. Or if, you, if you don't, if you don't want, I, I can. No, I'm happy to keep reading because read. I think we're going to read into a another important we get a bit. point. Okay, so. The last human exodus from the islands of Austronesia onto the mainland occurred after the last ice age about 30,000 years ago. On the first such exodus, two ice ages ago, which was two and a half million years ago, those humans who had mastered horses mounted them and leaving their on foot rice growing sheep and goat herding and on foot hunting brethren behind, rode northwest to hunt wild animals until the next ice age forced them to endure survival in caves of non-glaciated Western Europe. With skin and hair all bleached, they emerged and mounted horses 30 question thousand years ago to confront the westward on foot or on camel caravanning of the earliest Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations of written history. The latter civilization probably developed from the Indian Ocean and Austronesian island atoll people blown westward on rafts to a Queen Hatshepsut's source of pictures for her Egyptian shipbuilding, which source the Egyptians called the land of Pun, which we now know to have been Somaliland, the leaky Zolduvai gorge country, and B to Arabia blown by the twin monsoon easterlies of the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea. The word pun 
in South African colored language means red. The Red Sea is the Pun Sea. The Pun is the pun of Punitians or later Phoenicians of Carthage's and Rome's Punic Wars. If you look at my Dimaxian world map. There it is. Yeah. Well, kind of. Yeah. And John, you have one in your... Yeah, I've got one in my office, yeah, yeah, and yeah, I've got a number of them around. There is no visible distortion of the relative shape or size of any of the land or water patterning. You will find 100 dots, each representing 1% of humanity, as at 1980. That is, each dot represents 44 million human beings. Each 1% is carefully located in the demographic centre of each 44 million grouping of the Earth's total people. It's all changed significantly since then. You can see on my map that within an area that is only about 8% of the Earth's total surface, known as the Orient, which contains India, China and Southeast Asia, 54% of humanity exists. Of this 54%, 8% are the as yet islanded or peninsulared water people, Java 3%, Philippines 1%, Java, Sumatra, etc. 3%, Singapore and the lower Malay Peninsula 1%. Going on the globe westward following the sun and facing into the prevailing north and southwesterly winds, we observe Asia Minor, Africa and Europe with 32%, then the West, the Americas with 14% of all humanity. Kipling wrote in 1900, East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Mm -hmm. All who read him, all who read him thought Kipling was obviously correct. No one in 1900 could foresee the as yet uninvented aeroplanes, let alone 350 passenger carrying 500 mile per hour intercontinental and around the world flying jet aeroplanes, nor satellite relayed intercontinental telephony, etc. You can see on my map the enormous concentration of humanity in Java, Malaysia and the Indonesian islands, as well as the original waterfront areas of the Asian mainland. Together, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos and Vietnam are the beachheads of Austronesian islanders landing upon the Asian continent. Clearly, that is where humanity first went inland and upland to the Himalayas, exploring the Mekong River toward its source. This extraordinary fact relates also to the last ice age and uniquely to the 8% of my world map known as the Orient, which contains the 54% of humanity. Looking closely at this area, we see the Indus River rising in the Himalayas and flowing westward to Karachi, then into the Arabian Sea, then starting in almost the same high Himalayan place as the Indus, we see the Ganges flowing initially westward, then turning eastward and flowing south of the Himalayas to the Bay of Bengal. Next, we note the Brahmaputra River originating within 100 miles of the source of the Indus and Ganges and flowing first eastward and then southward to penetrate the Himalayas, whence it flows also to the Bay of Bengal. Then we note the Salween, the Mekong, the Yangtze and the Yellow River, all starting from approximately the same geographical source atop the Himalaya mountains, an area so small that my finger, forefinger tip can cover it on my map, thus 54% of humanity, over eight times the population of North America, is watered from the same reservoir, the frozen Himalaya, Himalayan reservoir, which melts just fast enough to keep things growing and life going on through ages and ages and ages. As the water people came out of the ocean island habitats and began to ascend those rivers and carried aloft their canoes around and above the rapids and waterfalls, they could not help eventually discovering the common regional source of this comprehensive life support water. In the present critical unrest of our world, where we find the greatest ideologically warring powers on our planet puppeting through Vietnam, the dissensions into warrings of Cambodians, Laotians, Thais and Burmese, it is clearly seen that the only differences between those Southeast Asian peoples are the rivers by which they go inland and upland to the same source of life supporting water. Is it easy to understand why the Dalai Lama was located in Tibet, the source of all their water? 
that source epitomized God as the physical life giver and taker. That's interesting. I'll just talk about it that way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I haven't thought about it that way at all. Um, hmm. But it also shows, you know, indirectly just how interrelated we actually are as people. Hmm. Uh, you know, that the only thing that separates us is these couple of rivers. <laughs> I mean, and that, you know, they're, that's the differences. And, um, and it shows you how, I don't know, for some reason we fight with each other. I think, I think this reading, this speculative stuff can be dangerous. It really, really can be dangerous. What's you know, dangerous? Well, let's, let's put it this way. You remember the world, uh, Joseph Campbell's book? Yeah. About memes. So he can, this thing can become culture. Mm -hmm. And this speculation, I repeat it, just fits facts for a period. Facts that were known at a period. It does not fit the facts of today. It does not. So the I, only to I, me, yeah, the only to me, the only thing that I take and understand it on this speculation is the fact that it is coherent and help us to understand better the particular, going from the general to the micro. And remember that if you go from the general to the micro. And especially if you want to define the micro, there are many micros. You shouldn't be overemphasized. It's just, it's not a generalizing theory, it's a deductive theory. And it is, if somebody, if people hang on to it to build their world and they see it, it can become dangerous. Let's put it blunt. Yeah. There's no role of a black guy here in this in this story that is is told. There's none. I was thinking the same thing. You understand what I'm saying? But it's, it's no, just I, I, it espouses a period of history. But there are artifacts today that are on earth. I'm not saying that they invalidate this, but they predate this. So it is, in my opinion, humble opinion, it is a story of part of humanity mm. that evolved in a certain way. Another part evolved in another way, but all mm -hmm. the story of the same tribe, of the same people. I agree with you 100%. I mean, I was kind of thinking something similar to that too. I, there is a, the, there's a reason to, uh, I mean, clearly there's an under, the reason to understand history um, and even understand the, the, the evolutionary components that, you know, we're talking about, but um, meaning from like the Bronze Age, the Steel Age, the Digital Age, understanding that kind of, that kind of uh, history is, is, is actually important, but this is very dangerous because it's particular, and if you put this in the context of even the, like the, the United States, to a certain extent, this is why you know people may tell themselves a story where they're trying to hold on to the past as opposed to look to the future. And um, yeah, I mean, telling a story like this is. Um, It is dangerous. Sorry, it is. It is what it is. Let's I continue, uh, John. Because Matthew was a great researcher, he had developed um, an above-average ability to look at and extract information from um, what he studied. And what I hear you saying, Manu, is that we now know, forty years later the things that Bucky believed in 1982 have been proved not to be true in 2022. Is that what you're saying? No, they are true. They are true. 
but they're not, there is more. Yes, yes, there's been, there's been more information discovered. Yes, there's more information discovered. Yeah. That put, because you draw a conclusion in terms of where it all started and how you sure. evolved. Sure. Yes. But I think that's not as important as the overall story that Bucky's telling about. Um, what well, less so here than the Grunch of Giants. In the Grunch of Giants, he's trying to alert us to the dangers of the world's wealth being controlled by a very small group mm. who are not interested in the well-being of humanity overall. And yeah. I mean, if you go another interesting book that's that's good in its research is a book called The Sovereign Individual, which has a lot of research, goes back and traces things and then comes forward and projects. But what it says is, amongst other things, there's a breakdown in law and order. Um, if you want to be safe and be independent, you need to have at least residence in two countries and your wealth in more than two countries. Because you go, they go back, the authors of that book go back and say, look, if you trace history, if governments want to take money from you, they'll take it. They decided they wanted more money, they taxed the number of chimneys, the number of windows, the number of toilets. So governments are constantly looking for more ways to tax, particularly in Australia at the moment. We are going to see significant new taxes introduced over the next five or 10 years, more land taxes, because the authors of the sovereign individual say the one thing you can't move is land. You can have other assets and move them, but land is physically there and you can't move it and therefore governments can always tax you on it. And in fact, historically, there've been times when it was the greatest single source of tax revenue. Now, if those with real money and mobility can move between countries and have their wealth in different countries, it's harder for governments to tax them. And in fact, I think in some countries, if you're very wealthy, you can agree on how, how much tax you'll pay. And that's it. Because the government will agree that to have you move to pay tax in that country. Mm -hmm. So what Bucky was trying to do, I think, was to study history, to um, accumulate as much information as he could, and then to project from that. In 1982, in the Grunch of Giants, he was trying to predict, but we now know he was badly out in his predictions. Because in the 40 years since, the US has got itself further into debt, not out of debt. We've had the GFC of 2008. We've had fortunes lost and, and many poor people lose everything they had. But, you know, I think it was Iceland, wasn't it? Got drawn into global banking and wound up uh, losing a fortune post GFC. So I'm looking for in this guides to what's coming using the past to understand what's ahead so that we have some ch some chance of educating people. Um, I mean, and, and one of the things is there is so much misinformation and increasingly, I mean, one of the last things I've seen is that AI now makes it almost impossible to tell whether news is true or not true because up until now they've been able to tell whether photographs were true or fake but with AI, they're getting to the stage where they can't tell. Mm. Where material can be produced that it's almost impossible to prove isn't true. Mm. So, I, think, I think the danger is a danger of capture. In order to tell a narrative that supports some role. It's not in the methodology. And in science, and Bucky is a scientist, yes. is, well, you are very open to the fact that Things will change your theory in the future. Hmm. When you have a theory and a hypothesis, you're always open to testing that hypothesis. That hypothesis yeah. holds until the day when one fact, one, contradicts it. It doesn't hold anymore. It becomes a particular case. Hmm. That was the case for Newtonian physics until Einstein. And that has been the case since for everything. So hmm. what I'm trying to say here is it's easy for some people that are in power to take an hypothesis that generally was put, mm. support a scientific approach and make it something else. Especially when we are, they have the, the ability to skim the text mm. and present something. You see, you see Bucky before he says something, it goes like, you can be tired of mm. all the consideration that he takes, that he makes before he gets, he hits one point. 
considering this, considering that, considering that. That's what he did here. Yeah, it was an incredible research. It, 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 it started with, you know, the land, the ice ages. I mean, that is going thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, millions of years before into building progressively to come to something. And it is easy for some guy to just come and read that and take it and say, well, that's it. Wow, it supports my ideology and that's it. Right. On the basis of that, I'm going to do to go out and do this. You get what I'm trying to say? Oh, no, whereas, I mean, it... whereas Bucky's map, that density of population that he's talking about, he is saying that if it is you beings that we're looking for, I'm not would have been a communist or capitalist or whatever ideology, and the flows, there's circulation of resources and the produce of processing these resources, it's got to reflect it. At least in terms of potential for us to kind of assume better our role of you know, the guy who sues, who sues at the, you know, at the local level in support of something that is bigger. That's what he said. You're, you're so saying- he says, he says something to the US. To an American right. is, gosh, how much energy am I consuming? Right? To, to, to support my lifestyle? Is it even sustainable? Not to talk about regenerating, no. is it sustainable? Sustainable. Those are the questions that these kind of things that we're reading- On the other hand, I had, us example, I had an example this week. I was talking to a businessman who provided me with information about attempts to make much less expensive electricity available that had been thwarted by large companies and governments. The governments collect a large amount of revenue from energy generation. Most of them certainly in Australia have interests in utilities. And he gave me some specific examples. This is one of the things where vested interests, power of governments and large companies can try to suppress to, um, as Bucky said, many big companies tried to um, challenge his patents, but were unsuccessful because his patents were very carefully prepared and registered. Mm. But there are huge amounts of money, huge vested interests globally in the grunge of giants that are suppressing. I mean, if we were serious, if we could persuade those in power, governments and large companies to work to provide enough energy, enough food for everybody, it could be done but they're making too much money in the short term and don't really care at what price. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, we have increasingly people who can't afford in the, in the more developed countries can't afford the energy they need. They can't afford the electricity because of the prices. You know, somebody recently told me that their bill in the UK had gone from 200 pound a month to 800 pound a month in less than a year to have a 400% increase in the cost of energy, which is fairly essential. Like yeah. you said, you know, electricity is the first thing we need for heating, yeah. for cooling, for refrigeration, to preserve medication, for sanitation. The availability of electricity is fundamental to stand of living in a whole lot of things. Yeah. So um, I don't know how we better inform ourselves and then better inform those around us um, and, and what is required to get the message through. Because look at the debate we've got going on over climate change. You know, it's an ideological thing. There are those who deny it. There are those who acknowledge it. Um, who knows what the real truth is, but temperatures are rising. We have increasing fires. Look at Canada at the moment. Canada's you know, ravaged by fires from one side of the country to the other. Um, I don't believe this is just history repeating itself. But perhaps well, thousands happened. of years ago, before we had records, it happened. Yeah, yeah. But but it, the solution, I mean, not the I mean, 
I intuit at and at my intuition is that the solution is in the mix and to using whatever source for what is the most appropriate to do. You know, in my opinion, gasoline or fossil fuel, and they're not fossil fuel in general, mm. because because uh, 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 nuclear is fossil fuel, but but hydrocarbons could mm. never have been used for individual cars. Never. It has been, should have been used for powering things, transportation, heavy transportation. Mm. Individual cars, we should have developed ways mm. of connecting, say, the bicycle even. I'm going to have to go today, check it out. There's a small scooter with yeah. a small scooter we, we, with, we, uh, we, with uh, the actually, battery. Actually, sorry, it's after one. I'm going to have to go. Yeah, we need to do uh, uh, takeaways really quickly. Uh, uh, okay. John, do you uh, have a take? Do you have a, um, you want to get us started? Yeah, I'm just feeling frustrated and um, I hope that this study would great provide me with greater means of contributing to positive changes. Perhaps it's just too much bad news at the moment, too many challenges, watching vested interests promoted to the detriment of the average individual. But I'm feeling a little frustrated and probably disheartened at the moment with the challenges and whether I'm in any way better empowering myself to deal with those challenges through through this at the moment. So feeling frustrated and challenged. That's how I'm feeling today. So Manu, how do you feel? I, I don't feel frustrated. I feel challenged, but not frustrated. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, you express it that way because I might just be to <laughs> some kind, but I think that Bucky believed that technology, that the science and technology were going to overwhelm the system on their own. And maybe it's not yet time. Maybe it's slower than what he thought. Mm. Maybe it's not going to be true. But I believe in one thing, is that if a substantial number of people can start to think as Becky has helped us to understand what thinking is, that is, to understand some general principles and to be ready to apply them. At least in the lives, there will be differences. Because I'm really at pain today to see that inflation is running in many countries at 20, 30%. And we've been told that it's 5%. Therefore, anchoring everything that we have in terms of income at 5%, but spending, at 20% rate, mm. there is a mismatch. It can't hold, mm. it's not balanced. But energy flows to balance somewhere. And then that disrupted again, it flows again. That's what it does. So to me, if individually, many, many people can come to at least understand that, they wouldn't be hotheads, as Bucky says, there will be thinking and acting heads. And as Joe said, if you can discern what a trim tap in a situation is, and actually be able to take control of that trim tap, your reach can be very far. And I think about Grameen Bank, what hmm. this guy did, hmm. you know. So those Not are things, problem. most Not people problem. came came to Bangladesh they will run away, too much poverty, too much suffering. Mm. But this guy left the US, he was in Bangladesh, and he thought more generally that at the causes mm. and designed a solution that took root mm. and dented the evolution the way it was in that area. 
And those are kind of things that we do. And we can only do for as much as we can because it's not guaranteed that anything that we start will catch fire. But yeah. we are bound, we have to always start, always be doing, thinking and doing in the hope that one will pay off for the whole cost that we incur in doing that. Mm -hmm. It might be after our lifetime, but it will always be a good thing to be doing. So we shouldn't mm -hmm. be desperate. That's my main takeaway from this. All right. So Joe, you, how do you feel? What do you take away? I, uh, you know, I feel good. Um, John, thank you for reading. Uh, I'll be very quick and brief. Um, I, you know, I see the use of generalized principles and how they are applied, uh, the importance of them. You start to see how you can do trend analysis using generalized principles. Um, to the point earlier, Manu, I do think that there is the risk when you when you put things down on paper, um, the particulars and uh, on down on paper, um, you have run the risk of people taking the part and assigning a value to the whole. And I think that that's what the real issue is. And that's dangerous both on a micro level, meaning as an individual, if I assess one part of myself and assign it to the whole as what it means to be a good human being, I'd be wrong. So, you know, so that the, it's the same, it's the same idea. And I and I so there there is that problem. That problem exists. Uh, you often see it in economics where people will ex extract data from different periods and start to say, "Hey, look, that's why I like Ray Dalio. He tends to try to go back over long periods of time." But anyway, uh, oh sorry. Uh, but but uh, the you know I think um, this is a productive discussion on a number of levels. Uh, you know, you start to see, um, you start to see the connections between trends, uh, uh, no matter what. It, it, even when when you're reading Bucky, and I and I think his research was being done, even if he was uh, maybe maybe off on certain things, he was doing it with he with a, a a high level degree, a high degree of integrity. Mm. Uh, so I do believe that. So it's 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 the um, how it could be potentially misused is part of the problem. Um, I, my other main takeaway is, uh, and and I have been thinking about this for a while, is that we really do need to start thinking in terms of trim tabs, um, mm. because you're not going to change the financial system overnight, and you're not going to change the way governments spend money overnight. And so until you start to do make incremental changes so that systemic design and sustainable design can actually be um, implemented, uh, I think that, um, and, and, I, and you know, I'm sure I'm not the only person thinking this, uh, but until you do that, um, I, I think it's gonna, it, be, it becomes a much more difficult task and then yeah it becomes frustrating because you look at the problems that we have to solve and you think you have to solve them in one and uh with you know a, a, with one fell swoop uh then that becomes overwhelming mm -hmm. um so i'm hopeful and i'm hopeful in in the, in the in the minor changes that can be made and um but um uh as i'm concerned as well as we all should be uh, mm. So there's a lot to be concerned about. So, you know, John, thank you again for reading this evening. That's right. Um, it was uh, there was there was quite a bit to read. It was a lot of work. Um, Manu, thank you for getting up at five o'clock, uh, <laughs> and thank you for making the the uh, end of my weekend uh, uh, enjoyable. Uh, you know, it, it, it's I was just thinking that during the whole time, uh, you know, the 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 things that we were sharing with each other and doing with each other. You know, these are things you'll never forget. Um, you know, uh, whether it be John reading and, and sharing thoughts and Manu and, and these conversations. Uh, so um, thank you for those memories. Uh, thanks. Anyway, thanks, Manu. thanks guys. John, and I'll John, see you guys. John, before you go, one second. I knew a guy in Perth who mm -hmm. live on a boat 
and it was trying to use to produce energy, you know, at di digging in the sea and taking heat up to produce energy. Do you know that guy? He had a boat, Alan something. I think his first name was Alan. Mm -hmm. he's, um, he's in Perth. I, I thought maybe that was the guy you were talking about. No. You know, he was on the verge of something. He was developing this stuff where no, you sure know you would sure. drill yeah. at sea. And then experiments being software? done in in, in um, using the energy of the ocean. Uh, yes. Carnegie, I think Carnegie is the name of the company at the moment. They've been doing research off Perth at tapping into the water flow to generate electricity. Yes. Anyway, I've got to leave you. Okay, okay. John. Take care, guys. Yes. All right. Oh, Joe, yeah, that's cool. That's what the Navy, that's what the Navy should be doing. Yeah. I think I think Critical Path is one of the best books of Buckley. I do too. I, I because think it's it one is of the it is one of those books that sits, you know, in every situation. It will help you to think or to at least to yeah. ask questions that are quite deep. And every time well, you read you come up with something, a different perspective. Well, and that's how you can tell a great text, actually, is you keep reading it and you come up with something new each time. And and no. yeah, I'm starting, what you start to see is the application of generalized principles, even this evening, you know, you I've seen similar uh, ephemerization <laughs> in the past, but it became very evident with, you know, looking at the Bronze Age, steel, and then digital. And you, you know these are three different points in time. Um, also, uh, just looking at how Marx looked at things as well, and uh, unity is plural is minimum too. I you know kind of looking at that um, how things are not monolithic and they're interconnected. I, I'm starting to see that much more clearly uh, yeah. what that means, and that takes time. Uh, sometimes when you're just applying, and I'm starting to just see things a little bit um, more clearly. I mean, there's some stuff in there that was a little bit lost on me with the, with the rivers, but um, but that you know I can come back to that. But it, it's critical path, utopian and oblivion, and Grancha giants are the most practical Bucky books that are actually I think that are the most insightful as well. Um, I now. Geometry of thought, I mean, synergetics is clearly the best, but it's also, uh, you know, it's harder, that's all. Uh, it's harder to read, so. But, 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 you know, like critical path, you see the title, what it means. What do you mean by critical? You know, somebody, Kiyosaki usually use a metaphor, is that every coin has at least three sides. Face tail, inside, and then contour. Face tail and the contour, right? In the control, the yes, the contour okay. of the coin. Now, where do you prefer? Where is it critical for you to be? Is it on the face, permanently, or on the tail? Uh, no, in the quarter uh, to be able to in control on the edge. Yeah, on the edge where you're making the connection yes. between the two. So on the edge, oh, you point. always be obliged to be equin uh, equinemous. You always, if you want to remain on the edge, you always dip on face for a while and come back. You always dip on tail for a while and come back. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. Like, it's like, you know, I always take the example of uh, of um, lizard. Hmm. You see the lizard, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine a lizard on a crate of a roof. Right? It does this, it does that. It does this, it does that. Right, right, right. It has a balance. <laughs> yeah, so, so if you were just on one side of the roof, you wouldn't be able to see what is on the other side. You get what I'm saying? And I, I, absolutely, no. And it's it, the idea of how perspective changes. Uh, if you and if you only stay on one side, then you yeah. got a problem. 
and, yeah. and that's 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 one of the issues that we were just talking about is the way uh, people can use parts to define the whole yeah and and that's would be the same thing in a way and to be on the crit is dynamic it's difficult because yeah, winds are blowing, right. things are happening on either side. So, so you, you, really need, you really need to be, you know, it is what you call equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium of things changing, of saying that's relatively complex because this thing is always trying to tilt this way or that way. And you have to maintain yourself to maintain the ability to see both quickly, alternatively what is happening you cannot see both at the same time, but you can alternate very quickly. Frequency modulation. Amplitude yeah. modulation, frequency I modulation. Am, I was actually you see, you see the basic. Amplitude, yeah. you are on the crit. You are out there on the crit. That's and the amplitude. The frequency, yeah. The frequency, I mean, look here, there, there. Quick, 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 quick. Well, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's like the circles of relevancy from there. You yes. Get the, so you start and, to see the, and that is the power of computation. Our power of computation, the power of division, and see quickly. Yeah, if you see, yes. Right? If you could see, but yes. That on its own is nothing until we have what we want to do or the problem to solve. That it can be effective. The problem to solve is amplitude. Right. Where do I want to reach? Yes. That's the problem right. to solve. Right. And frequency is computation, dividing in many, many parts and putting them back together to have an image of what the big picture is. And you want to be on the edge, as you mentioned, like always yes. on the border. Yes. And, and you need to be change first. Change always happens on the edge, isn't it? Right. On the well, yeah, because change. The People are talking beyond, about beyond. change from your from inside, but that inside is that change that manifests outside from inside is because you had inside and outside in your being. You have defined the inside. When you say change right. starts from inside, it means that it's at the border between that imagine inside and the re remainder, the outer of your body. That other people see. Right. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's what it means. But it doesn't mean there's nothing that starts from inside us because fundamentally we're always reactive. There's nothing that starts from inside us? No. To talk about it really, really at the fundamental level. Why would something okay. start from inside you? if everything that you have got into you first. I see what you're saying. If you're looking at it from a systemic perspective, but if you look, it would only start inside you, but that, it's different. I was thinking of it differently. Okay. You're right. I'm saying this, uh, when we conceive or when we're born, what is fundamental into us? is the capacity to store and the capacity to communicate. Yes, absolutely. Every embryo, every concept already communicate with the macro of it, that is the uterus of the mother, okay. and store somewhere in the cell. Okay. You get me? Yes, when the first no, cell, you mean cell, conception at that minute, that is present. Right? That's right. Unity and you're plural in, at the minimum of two. Two. So, so that capacity that is empty, but it's a capacity in the beginning, receives, right? It receives information that is stores, starts storing to making you. That's why they talk of reflexes. A reflex means something that is coming, that condition you, and then you respond to it. It's always a responsibility that we have. 
is never an initiation ability. What we think about initiation is what we have been able to master very early. That now appears like it is innately initial, it's not. Energy flows, if you also take what Steve will talk, the Taurus. Yeah. That in there is nothing with that because it's because energy is flowing to it. So there was an input and an output, but it's so close and so intense that we define it as the heart of it. Right. right? Okay. Yeah, now I'm saying. That's okay. the same for us. We're not different. I see what you're saying now. I, I do. It, it, that's much more clear. That was yeah. much more clear. So it's always the question of a response time. But response time, that is control. Intelligence is shorter response time to the point. Intelligence and is sh shorter response. In res shorter response time to the point. I mean, to the situation. OK, OK, through a particular. Stupidity and unwiseness is shorter response time that is ill-advised. That's okay. not that fine. Yes, that I understand. Because it's a principle you're talking about in that particular yes. instance. They say you are wise when you are able to respond to a situation in a way that is required for it to be solved, that challenge. And the faster you can do it, the more intelligent they say you are, or the wiser you, they say you are. Now, but is that is that intelligence though? I mean, so I agree with you. That is the faster you can respond to a situation and answer a problem is essentially that's what intelligence is. Yeah. But but if you're if you're not thinking about why the problem exists in the first place, then then that's, that's, that's not intelligence, that's, that's stupidity. Okay, yeah, okay. As that's what that's why I say, I say intelligence is the fastest response to a situation, addressing that situation the way it had to be. There's a problem, you solve the problem. Right. That is intelligence. Stupidity is approaching the problem the fastest, not knowing what you are doing. Yeah, and, and getting to a point that doesn't solve the underlying. Yeah, yeah, because you are going to get stuck in any way. Right. And you're not expanding the boundary at yeah. that point. Say, for example, we want to count the time that you, that, that you have to jump off a cliff and come down. Mm -hmm. Right? So one person, Devise a parachute, come and jump and land properly, safe. You, you just don't come and jump over the, uh, the, 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 the cliff. You might, so you might die. You, will be die. You, you might be faster than the guy who used the parachute, but you'll be dead. Right? That okay. is stupidity. In hindsight, it's okay. stupid. That's it. Yeah. Because the game in which we are, remember the three laws of thermodynamics. You can win, you can draw, you can withdraw. You remember that? We discussed that. Mm -mm. Not you can win. You can win conservation of energy. You cannot create energy. That I, okay. Okay. You can draw because whatever you do, there's entropy. Right. Right? That's right. You can withdraw because if you withdraw, you will be at 270 minus 270 degrees Kelvin. You will be dead. Frozen, there's no life. There's no movement of, of a particle or, 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 or cells. You know, if you are the absolute frozen temperature, you're dead. You know that. You're not coming back. So you're no more in the game of life. That's, you know, it's funny you're saying this because just as today, earlier, I was thinking about something 
that actually went into this and you know somebody that uh, in in the, in the person that i know um who who passed away you know she had been in a wheelchair and i said you know you could take that pain and you could do one of three things right you can be angry mm -hmm. and at the world um you can take the energy and try and change you know the world around you for the better and the third thing you can do is turn in on yourself which is essentially death and so that's the same thing as like kind of what we were just talking about in a way it's mm -hmm. it, it's 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 you're either dead um or you're one of the other two mm -hmm. but i don't know if it's a direct correlation but i was thinking about that anyway and how that what that meant as it you, you have to define what life, life is at the most general life is kicking that's what life is right at the most primitive level life is moving that's right huh? uh, yeah. You are alive or yeah dead. right that's true yes okay, so the game of life is moving and there are laws it says you cannot create life or you cannot create energy, so you cannot win at the game. You cannot draw because everything that you do has consequences. And in a final system, if what you obtain is part is a part of it that is gone into the environment, right? That's like what you call we, we, we discuss it in the um, time. And then you cannot withdraw, but you you draw your debt. We're not playing the game anymore. Anyway, I want to leave you with this, Joe. No, it's good. I'm, I, I'm, I, the more I think about this, and it's, and the more I'm thinking about these things, it, I, it's starting to become more clear. Yeah. More so, um, I'm having, I'm having a little bit more frequently, more frequent, um insights yeah. than i did before more than i more more my frequency is increasing I'll i think that. i do a sincerely think over all these years i've been studying uh bucky with uh kelly and others for now probably 16 years 15 16 years really wow. that we'll be meeting weekly at least and what has come out of it is this one. If you understand, life starts with awareness. That's the first thing that Bucky says. Life starts with awareness. And he says, unity is plural at a minimum of two. Right? Not two yes. opposed, two dancing. He called them duals. And the definition of a dual of something is that they always coexist. That they always coexist. That's what there's... the dual means. Most people be, be understand dual as opposite. That's not it. It's always coexisting. And that's that, the interconnectedness. Yeah. Yes. Now, from that too, you can build rules and have complex systems. Okay. And, and, and you can have harmony. And have them come together in a way that they make systems. A system means you have a system. You understand what the system is. It means that you can put input and you have output and you can measure it. Right? Right. That's what you call a system. We create the system we create. We have to be able to have an input and have a predictable output and measure the gap between the two in order to maintain it or to regenerate it. That's all we are doing in terms of anticipatory design. Hmm. 
So we observe nature because nature, we didn't create nature, we are in nature. Right? We are in. Right. We can't create nature. Nature yeah, is doing yeah. it. So the best, we've seen that the best for us locally, since the local is part of the big, is only those rules. If you can observe those rules, try to understand them, and be patient enough to create mimics of those artifacts based on those to solve particular problem, then we'll succeed. Mm. But if we don't, there's high chance that we'll be the catastrophe for ourselves or to ourselves. The unmaking, yes, the unmaking of a you being is of the you being's own actions. Unless there is an hypothetical like impact on Earth of a comet or something of a sort. But even with impact, life has survived on Earth. Because the Earth, as we know it, from what we discover, has been impacted, right? But life has continued. But life in a form that you, Joe, and I are living, it is possible that if we not, we don't listen to the voice of God, the nature of words, then we we'll undo We're ourselves. Yes. Yeah, that's true. That's why Bucky says, the final examination is that of an individual, not of a system. Because knowing that an individual can have so much impact on his environment and on his following, well, what you are doing can be huge. You talk about the trim tab, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can really impact your community, seriously. And but that, you have to... Yeah. You have, you have to rely on principles, though. That's the yes. key to the, that's You God. have to not only, not only think and know what it is, the principles, but you have to design your artifact according to those laws. Yeah, that's true. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. If the moon, if the moon takes 24 hours to circle around the Earth, the orbit of a moon around the Earth, 24 hours. Don't expect the moon to circulate, to, to go around the Earth in 10 hours. It's not the same moon, right? That's you need right. to have an orbit at a different level for that to happen. That's if right. it's farther than where it is, then it's possible. But if it's closer, right. but if it's in the same. <laughs> yeah. The distance so, stays so, the same. The boundary yes. stays the same. Mm -hmm. That plays for the issue of debt. Debt has been accumulating since in the world since the 60s. Mm -hmm. The last period of the real excesses was after the Second World War, or the 50s. Right. That's right. Since the 60s, all of that credit has been depleted, depleting, depleting. We substituting for debt, right? Somebody right. owes somebody. Debt means transfer of results from one place to the other. And it's been going on for 50 years. And then we see history, we read history like Ray Dalio says. You go back 500 years, you see that it's happened. It's not new. There was Jubilee. The Jubilee, the king or the queen, the whole city or the whole kingdom and say, we forgive your, your debt. And then they restart anew, uh, right? Right. So there had yeah, to be no. a recalibration of our monetary system. No, I, and, and there would have been one. And, and you know, it, it, I heard, it's hard to say, but if you let, things die 
something new will emerge, right? Yeah. In other words, but if you keep piling on to the same system like that, well, then it's not going to necessarily work or it's, it, it'll be a problem down the line. Yeah. It's not sustainable. Not sustainable. You no, know, we have the resources on this earth. We yeah, have, yeah. right? Oh no, we have plenty. Resources. It's just that they are locked in one country or the other. Yeah. We have the know-how locked in one country or the other. All we as you've been are doing mainly, we spend time trying to build dams to stem the flow. I have a resource, I want to keep it. You want it, we start the war. Both of us are losers because we are members of the same family. Right. We're losing because the family as a whole is losing. That's right. No, and that's where that's what it is. understanding. Yeah, and that's why understanding. Yeah. Uh, Technology is there. Plural. So what for to me, what has improved is that Bucky was too optimistic about what will happen. We have technology today. It is yeah. present. We know. We know what to use nuclear energy for. Oh uh, yeah. We know what to use to spend our fossil energy on you know, hydrocarbons. We know how to use to kind of harvest soil. But we refuse to build a transmission grid with island right. energy. In other words, the US would prefer to burn that energy, waste it, right? Rather than we haven't built a line to go where, when the US is asleep, the energy that is produced or that was produced in excess and store is going to flow. So we haven't invested in transmission even nearly half enough. Well, and that goes back to because we're we're not investing in it because we're spending it on other things that actually, as you mentioned, what you said was profound, that don't serve us. So it's crowding out any kind of other real sustainable information, uh, inf uh, infrastructure or changes. Yeah. So that that that's that's the problem with that. It crowds out the possibility um, of of uh, of investment, but that uh, of investing in new uh, new infrastructure. However, there still is an opportunity. As you said, we have plenty of resources and resources aren't just money. Uh, so we have plenty of resources to actually to make changes that need to be made. But it's, you know, making, ma getting the trim tabs to work or that's the I think it is required. One busy condition is accounting. Oh, yeah. And money is first a unit of account. That's the first, first quality of money. A unit of account, right? Mm -hmm. it, money has to be a unit of account. Money has to be fungible. Money has to be divisible. Right. right? Money has to be a store of value. Right. Okay. In order for it to have those, because the first three, divisible, fungible, unit of account, is currencies. But if the unit of account is something that is variable or that can be cheated, it doesn't work. So the only way that you have integrity in the accounting is when the unit of exchange is going to be based on the unit of energy. Right. That's the one thing upon which you cannot tweak, you cannot change. You get me? Yeah. So that will allow proper distribution of resources. Agreed. I agree with That's that. That's the only way. 
everything has to be in alignment with you know in a sense that's yes. essentially what's being and, said and that will allow most people to see and then empathy is going to come out of that but out of a system where we are empathy is manifesting only as an individual like something that is innate which is not empathy is built out of similarity of con conditions for you to feel somebody you have to have experience is uh, not they say you have to you have you have it's better to have experience like that person then you have a real empathy for that person's condition right it's it's built out of two things it's built out of experience similar shared experience yes. but the other thing it's built out of is integrity yeah integrity in the system itself yeah because well, that today, creates the shared that creates a shared experience yeah today the so-called developed countries are they pollution when i say pollution the largest sense of it is at par with where they are in terms of income. Yeah. Because to me, it's, it, is, it is terrible to have a per capita income of $50,000 US dollars and having people who cannot, cannot have a good health system. You see, yeah. you see, yeah, I agree. No, that's that, a complete that, misallocation. That I was reading somewhere. Somebody was telling me in the U.S. today that people are six figure, but they cannot make it. Depending on what city, you, yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean you, you, you. So it shows. It shows how you know the unit of account has been distorted. Oh, we're doing. Uh, less with more yeah it's the opposite of a yeah because you're you know you're you're you have more money but you're getting less for it but we're doing more with less we are doing the general principles less. right we, we are but the but problem is that of capture alignment. that of capture right and you can't trust the government you can't trust anything any system because all of these guys are in Kehut. You can only trust when, you know, the majority of people are educated. Agreed. Or they see clearly how it works for them. You got to understand? Yeah. When you are educated and you want to act, then you can act appropriately to the situation. Knowing the general consequences. Or what is actually the issue? I mean, take, 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 take. We're talking about inflation, Joe. Right. Take a hundred people in the world, everywhere. I say everywhere. Tell them to tell you about what is inflation. How is it measured? Right. They wouldn't know. They don't know. Mm -mm. You know and, because and, you studied, and, but you are part they, of. A small, tiny, a small, tiny. Now, and this run across discipline, you know, where you have specialists, you know, like doctors, people who are nuclear physicists, people who are this that, people who are PhDs, but they don't know about the thing that impact them the most. That's right. They don't know about it. So how will they deal with even their taxes? It's no surprise that most of the high earning people are in trouble with the IRS. They don't understand what's going on. They don't understand. The, 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 the problem is, is that um, it's, there isn't even time to understand in certain circumstances. That's the other problem is like yeah. that it's, and that, that's a result of specialization. And fastness. Because and fastness. And fastness. But yeah, but a lack of wisdom. Yeah. And but because but of Joe, are... wind, wisdom only comes with time. There's no magic wisdom. 
That's the way we are built, unless we change humans. But at the core of our form, of our pattern, is that you spend time, layer upon layer. And if you don't do it, if you are, it is done inappropriately, it's very difficult to undo. Sometimes it's so hard that you have to undo it. You have to practice surgery on it before you start again. It's so, by the time you do that, your lifetime is gone, your time is up. That's why you see people sinking into situation, alcoholism, gangsterism, and all the isms. Because mm -hmm. they never have, we have limited time. And during most of those times, it was tough, we were stuck with bad things. And it becomes overwhelming. Right. So, so, so that's why I'm saying we have to, the only way that is, that is why it's going slowly because by the time that people like Becky put those things together, they were grown up people and they were system that's in place. In order for you to even be interested in Becky, you have to make a decision a hard decision of yourself. How am I going to spend my time? I mean, we could right. be, all of this while, we could be spending the four or five or six hours that we spent studying bhakti on doing something else. Oh yeah, I mean, but it's, it, it's, it's, um, part of this is expanding their consciousness so that it's not just expanding it so far as bhakti, it's actually seeing Bucky in other parts of our thinking, like outside. Yes. So we get the six hours and it's, yes, we'll understand critical path, we'll understand Grunch of Giants, but it's not just that, it's that we'll also understand a lot of other disciplines, systems thinking and being able to apply generalized principles to, so we can extract from this, um, things like how to look at history you know how to not necessarily look at it in a very narrowed view we look at it in a more broad view yeah like so the idea of using generalized principles to look at history so we're using something bigger than just critical path the, to be able to apply it to any other book that we read, yeah. um, whether it be Ray Dalio's book or whether it be uh, Talib's book, um, anybody, so that you can still use those principles. Yeah, anyway. I have my, my, my few principles, and then we will listen because I have to go some, some way. Is cool. that you have to be open. Yes, that's, that's number one. Lifelong, lifelong learner and doer. Lifelong learner, I need to learn the door. So, but you need to be open. You learn. Consciousness is openness, right? It's like... Oh, yeah. Almost, Otherwise, you're dead. Yes. Otherwise, you're dead. You have to be open and be and commit to be a lifelong learner. Lifelong education and lifelong doer. Because once you start like that, you can see problems and you have the boldness to tackle those problems. You will fail many, many times. But you dust yourself off as is a lesson that I've learned. You'll be miserable at times. But you could continue because you know that there's hope that you can do something better, you can impact better. That's what life is about. It's an exponential phenomenon. So either is exponential up. Right, right, right. Go to death. Those are the things. And all depend on your choices and some luck. It's, that is, it's a big part of its luck. Yes. Yeah, but that, that but if lock, you have no control over lock. That's right. What now, does the stoicist do? What you have control over? I, it's, you it's to the just, best of your abilities. 
Easy. Your own actions, your desires, your opinions, and yes, that's it. Yeah, that's no, it. it's not. It's not a lot. It's not yeah. a lot. What? Where you have choice, choose well and live well. Yes. That you get you in a better position when hard time come and hard time will come. And so it's just part of life. It's part of cycles. You have to accept that. Those are laws. Do <laughs> take care, my friend. I actually do want to talk. I want to. I want to follow up on this conversation, though, because I have a couple notes that I have to. I. I. I want to. I want to run past you. Yeah, good. So probably it will be. It will be better for Wednesday. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can bring it up on Wednesday. But this is, it, you know, what what I do. I take ideas on the weekend because the forum in the weekend is more general. Then I bring it on Wednesday where we go deeper. And then I will okay. pop, you know, you can you can put the idea up. And I'm sure we're gonna somebody's going to bite on it. <laughs> oh yeah, some uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it will be well, we definitely. Especially Steve will be there. So yes. he's gonna not gonna miss it. Steve, Susan, and uh, and Wayne, I'm sure they're going to buy. That's right. No, no, yeah. they will. I think I think yeah. I really appreciate the discussion that we had today. I think, you know, I didn't sleep much. Oh, I had it. There's, I had three huge insights, um, and 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 one of them is how to look at um, technological development using generalized principles became very evident to me. Mm -hmm. uh, understanding unity is uh, having our example with Karl Marx um, and uh, unity as a uh, unity is plural at a minimum of two, and as opposed to looking at them as duels and they ended up being duels that actually go at each other that was that was a huge and also on a higher level i kind of knew this but the way the history was presented um of peoples that it was looking at a part and defining a whole and that's dangerous well he wasn't but it can be used that way so mm -hmm. and so that and that is true with history about uh, people, but it's also true with about ourselves. Yes. Because if we take one part, one thing that we did well, and we define our whole by that, then that's not necessarily, um, that's not real. So this, three, I, this is a profound night for me. I, I mean, there's, I really am starting to see things um, using generalized principles. It takes it took me a little while, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. It's coming. And, I mean, even when you look and trim at the trim tab part, the trim tab part is important, but yeah. it's not as important. You look at Wolfram, for example. He, you know, in his uh, in his Rouliat, he come up with the thing that. In fact, you know, something that is close to a unified theory of everything. Right. You talk about gra gravity, gravitational, that is a constraint. You know, he says you building a stack is gravitational. Because you define constraint, you will constrain the problem, and then you are able to understand what is going on there, the rule of that, and you can you can come. You can computation, you can computize it in a way that you build a stack, meaning that you go higher and you understand more general, right? Yes, yeah. Absolutely. That was one. The second thing was entropy. Right? Mm -hmm. And it says that entropy, in actual fact, is uh no, no, not entropy. The second thing was was um the the Quant oh, quantum, quantum, uh, quantum, quantum physics. physics. Yeah, yes, quantum physics. How you'll yes. never be. He said it is, it, you know, his thing was a branching. There's no linear yeah. life stuff, no. but they are branching of time. You understand that? You know, when you yes. talk about it, the branch are of time. If you take a tree, a tree starts with a stem, with root in, coming to a stem, coming out. And then it branches, 
branches, branches, branches. So it's no more one time like this, not one, one arrow of time. No, no. You understand uh, yeah, that I time is cycles, right? And they can jump. So that is quantum physics, right? Yes. And then entropy, it took it as a, um, uh, biology, the way biology works, the way cells work, organism, it is irreducible. Right. say you have computational irreducibility. So you are forced to deal with a pattern. And you take that example of biology. So you have the three that have always been kind of thought about being separate that come on the rules of a roulette that is unifying the gravitational, the quanta, and the, the organic, let's just put it organic. Right? The uh, yeah, okay. The quantum. Let me just the, and, let me just see if I, I I have it here. I noted I not I not I not I noted it down. Let me just tell you what it says. Okay. Yes, it says space. Einstein gravitational equations. Space. Right. That is the continuum. Mm -hmm. You say branchial space. Quantum mechanics. Right. Right. And then second principle of thermodynamics is mole molecular physics. Well, uh, okay, yeah. Yes, and you see all the three great theories of physics of the 20th century are the result of the interplay between the computational irreducibility and the computational boundedness of observers. What does it mean to you? The interplay of irreducibility. Between the computational irreducibility and the computational boundedness. Irreducibility. Macro um, and micro. Yes. Macro and micro. Yes. Is interplay. Yeah. We are in between the observer. We are the observers. The circle or the quarter. Circle. Yes. The spheres of relevancy. Yes, that's what I was thinking about earlier. Yes. And then we are in there, interplay. We are the observer. Because what he's saying is that all the gravitational, the branch space, that is the quantum mechanics and the molecular is all from the point of view of the observer who is in the system. Right? That's right. And what is done there is just to define a language that seems to unify those three. That's what he's saying. He doesn't say he does, but he says up till now, for example, the game of life, you can see emerging patterns that look yeah. like biological patterns. Oof. Yeah, you, you can. See? You can see with computational modeling, you can see things. So it's, it's bounded clear, it actually, properly, yeah. it's bounded. You know, bounding is the rules. To define rule yes. is bound. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not to define rule is irreducible. To define rule is bounding. It's bounding. It's that's right. Yeah, that that okay. I so when you define rules, even the simplest of rules. Very quickly, you see emerging complex systems. Right. right. So you can start seeing the planets, solar systems. You can start seeing black holes appearing. All of those accumulation of things. 
right? Right. Because yeah, they are that prefer I for energy. I think that's the beauty of this. The, his discovery, his main discovery is that from very simple rules can emerge very complex systems as we see mm. in the making. And he's right. saying that at the beginning, at the Big Bang or wherever, they were just simple rules, very simple, maybe just two rules. That's right. And it and has evolved to become what it is. And the consequence was that from this point of view, it's evolved here, maybe there are parallel universes. Because that's not excluded. No, it, not, it doesn't come in contradiction with the theory of parallel universes. No, uh, and but and with and anyway, I, I that part I understand is that how rules actually create boundaries actually, and then emerge complex systems. So even I think about laws. That's an example, right? You can have yeah, a complex rule. system. Rule, it's a yeah. rule. Law yeah. is a rule. And but you can have a very complex system within those rules. Yeah. Like so uh, you know, you think about yeah, and just throwing things out there like Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know, you can have a pretty complex system within those rules. Yes. And that's a very micro example, but it's the same idea. And but, that applies but you know, just to put it together like that on that point. Christians and Muslims. They have the same root. Right. Ten Commandment is there. Yeah. They all, they both say, but look at what it is. Those two religions, what is created. Simple rules, complex systems. Simple. That's right. Yeah, if you go at the basis, it is the same. To all the prophets, you know, it's a, the, the, the Muslims say just Jesus was the penultimate prophet, right? Right, absolutely. That's what they say. They say Muhammad is the last one and Jesus was there, okay? But Christians say Jesus is a manifestation of God. That they're the one, that they're one in the right? same. So, so, so these two are the same fundamentally to one point. And Muslim does don't disown Jesus. They don't. Right? No, not at all. But look no. at what this is a simple rule, huh? At the basis, these are two things. The rule here in the rule like this is Jesus God. Right. Well that's and, the, and that Christian that's, says God. The Muslims say, no, it's not God, but he's a man of God. But those and those rules dictate complex systems. Yeah, it becomes. Look at how complex it start is is become. No, it becomes complete. I mean, I've got the Quran right here. It's like yeah. it's. It, it becomes pretty so, complex pretty fast. Yeah, so that's what yeah. I take from it is 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 that ability, uh, of, of you being able to understand things you accept the basic tenet of that approach of Becky. Look for the general first. And to look for a general is to look at the most simplified of rules. Life starts with awareness. Unity is plural Third, a minimum of two. Minimum two. And the two are duals, not meaning they oppose, meaning that they coexist. That is recognizing and, that the other one exists. And that, yes. And that, that's so how. That's recognizing harm, that you have an action, you have a reaction. Uh, and that's also how harmony can, is possible. Yes. Harmony is because, always in the dynamic of a dance. Right. It's a dance. Things are people waltzing. Yeah. Tangoing. And doing something yeah. like that. It needs two. Even rock and roll. 
Because you cannot spin. The man doesn't spin. When you say roll over Beethoven, roll over Beethoven, you have this couple dancing and then the male partner will, will, will swing the female and then she start pivoting, right? And then you yeah, take yeah. her when she's like this and make her orbit. It takes two. So everything that we do in harmony, and we are harmonies, we are harmonies, right? Yes. We are fractals, we are harmonies. Fractals mean harmonies, harmonious, going together. Every of those things is only done in a dynamic world. So if you define yourself as a conservative, you should only be a conservative. The only time that a conservative or a liberal is of a good thing is if you are a conservative of the eternally, eternal principle, general principle. Nothing else. Or you are a liberal of the eternal principle, mean that liberal mean that they can you accept that they apply everywhere. Right. Conservative means that you accept that you cannot change them. But that's not being open. Yes. So in that yeah. definition, a conservative and a liberal is the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. They're, that's they exactly dwarf. right. That's the only way. That's the only way. they're time. opposites. It's just, like, it's just like Marx and how he pinned workers against the uh the the uh Joe look at this all right I'm here I'm liberal I say I go I'll be right like this huh to mm -hmm. see you are conservative you say no 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 there's no other way there's only one road that is this one well, here with the same thing. And we saw it today in the text that both the conservative, the, the, the wealthy, those who appropriated the resources and Karl Marx were talking about the same thing. Right. Pertaining to their group. They were saying, they say they're the most fitted to continue whatever it is that is evolution. And that the other ones are parasites. That's what Marx said. The other guys say that if they are where they are, it's because they are able. The other guys are weak. So they all say, one way or the other, that the other guys is a parasite. It's only me. They didn't realize that they are on the same boat. Right? right? Yes. OK, Joe. <laughs> OK, my friend. I'll see you all on right. Wednesday. Okay, it's good cool. to see your smile. All Thanks right. Thanks for the extra time. Yes, I'm going to try to have an hour of sleep now. Me too. I got to go yeah. up in four hours. Bye okay. Bye. All right. Joe, cheers. Bye. Cheers. Take care, my friend. Bye.